I started as a bail boy at six or seven uh, for Uncle Bob doing stuff um, on the canoes. In those days, there were no fiberglass on the canoes at all. They were really all wooden boats. And um, when the sails, had, the wind had hit the sails and twist and rack and twist the hulls, being that they were just logs, water would spurt up underneath. I mean, literally just spurting water coming out of them. And so everyone had a bail boy. And the bail boy sat in the scuppers and bailed. You never saw the race. You just bailed. And they'd scream at you all race long. That's part of the six-year-old. <laughs> I've always had that love for the log canoes. It combines, for me, I, I do a lot of woodworking. And I'm a historian, and uh, I love the sense of tradition and the community that's involved there. And uh, growing up with it, I just, it appeals to me. Plus, it's actually, you know, the, the, the amount of focus and, yes, the um, deduction reasoning that's going on at all times, trying to pay attention to the crew, keep the boat as fast as it can go, and watching all the sails, keep everybody's head in the game, and watch how the wind's developing, how it's shifting, tactics are huge and quite frankly the crew is very very important that you can't do it all by yourself right. so and it takes a long time to train a crew to actually make those boats go fast you can sail them they may not go fast the boats that win have had crews that have been together for over a decade so, everybody has a job to do on those boats especially the smaller boats like a, the Noddy is only got a crew of seven four boardmen uh, two sail trimmers and a skipper who also trims a sail so, I mean, everybody has to know what they're doing. The bigger boats, they may have 15, 16. I mean, the JD, I've seen 24 people on her. Um, but they all can fudge with some newbies on board who can essentially, you know, help shift the board or at least get their weight out, but get out of the way and, and not be so uh, much of an integral part of the boat that they capsize the boat by doing something wrong. Whereas in well, the smaller boats, everybody's got to be dialed in and know what they're doing otherwise you're going swimming some boats you know when you have new crew and a skipper that's not or a skipper that's not so good and he's making wrong decisions with the helm and you capsize more than you should yeah. you know i've been on boats as a crew member when you know we've had really good skippers and you don't capsize as much and they had bad skippers and you capsize way too much and it's not all the skipper's fault and it's not all the crew's fault but it's usually a cascading uh, degree of errors that yeah. something happens and bam, bam, bam. And then yeah. the next thing you're going over. And sometimes when you go over, it's agonizingly slow and you can just watch it all unfold and everybody's go screaming and falling off the boards. And other times it happens so fast, they get catapulted 10 feet out in the, you know, into the sands. I mean, the hulls are in these families, especially down in Talbot County for Six generations of magic's been in the Green and the Wilson family. The Norths have uh, had some of their boats, and their grandfathers were builders of some of the most famous boats out there, or great-great-grandfathers, I'm sorry. Um, so, yeah, those hulls have been in, in the families for generations, and you pass them down. You know, it's, it's actually really... That's one of the things that I love so much about it, you know. That sense of community and history is, is it's not found everywhere else. So, you know, you pass the boat on down through the family. It's like they fight over the who's going to really be the skipper for the next generation, right? So there's a big family rivalries within the families. And I've watched all that dynamic. And then, of course, you know, yeah, the, the St. Michael's Mafia, as we call them, up here on the Chester River, um, always been trying to control the ratings, you know, to make their boats better uh, suited to win races. And it's always been a bit of a battle, you know. We've had um, more hulls up here on the Chester River in the last 30 years than they have down there, though. Oh, yeah, we're doing pretty well. We're doing pretty well. We've got um, a crew now for the Naughty that's been with us and, and still building for about four years and they're a bunch of young strong guys and they're really excited and they're all friends and and they're having a ball i mean they get out there every weekend and tolerate me being in the back and, and but they're all just having fun you know and, and they're competitive they're they're uh all college age and a little bit older now some of them yeah to be a good board man you know a good board man optimally is 200 to 240 pounds and fast 
and very, very, very highly balanced athlete. But the sailing rules are very, very structured and have been for centuries, quite frankly. And uh, those sailing rules really don't change all that much. And everybody who's a Corinthian spirited individual understands that you have to sail by the rules. Yes, can you, you know, play a little chicken and bluff and, and push the envelope a little? Yeah, but at the end of the day, if you do something wrong, you'll get thrown out of the race. Okay. Well, you know, it's, it's not that hard if you want to dedicate yourself to it. <clears throat> and you just can't get, you know, even if you're a really good sailor. I mean, I've raced against people who have bought canoes and then brought in professional crews, top Olympic sailors, right? They don't win. No. no. <laughs> Very rarely do they win, put it that way. Uh, they really have to have whole crews, and that means everybody's got to be there and work together. It's more teamwork on this boat than any other sailing craft I've ever been on.